Hello, my drumsters. It's Dawn Marie Mutel. Welcome back to another episode of The Little Drummer Girl. I have some really exciting news to share with you today. And I hope you don't mind if I share. You know, when you have those moments that go full circle, well, this is one of them. I'm going to keep it short, okay? But back in 2015, I went to my first PodFest Expo. And for those of you who aren't aware of what that is, it's actually a conference for podcasters. And so you'll get to meet the vendors and the people who are doing podcasts and top podcasters for that fact. And it grew so much that over the last five years, it's now a global event and it's also has broken records, okay? It's now with the Guinness Book of World Records as having the most uh, attention in one podcast and conference. And I am so excited to share that I will be speaking with them this week. So if you would like a free ticket, please go to my Instagram at little drummer girl 55. That's L I L drummer girl 55. And go into my DMS and ask me for a free ticket, just put free ticket and I will give you the code for a free ticket. But I did get to interview the founder of PodFest Expo, and his name is Chris Kremitzos. And when I did the Tampa Jam Virtual Summit last year, he was on the event. So I'm going to share this video over at the Tampa Jam YouTube channel where you can find the video of this interview. But here is the audio portion of it. And I thought, since I'm going to be speaking at PodFest, I might as well share this in case there's any of you out there who are thinking about becoming podcasters. All right. And thanks again for joining us. Chris Kremitzos is in the house. He is the chief creative officer of the PodFest Expo. If you're looking to start a podcast, this is the conference to go to. Chris started this about six years ago, and I went to one of them. It was 2015 was my first one. It was a year before my show took off, and it really pushed and inspired me to get my podcasts up, in which I have two of them. And He's a motivator, he's a change maker, he's a producer and a filmmaker. He's done it all. And what I love about it is that he is just so down to earth and he's just an amazing guy. I met Chris. He was the owner of the Tampa Bay Business Owners Association that was here in, in Tampa. And he would always hold these different events. You know, when I moved from New York here, he's also a fellow New Yorker and probably another reason why I love him dearly. But he was also, you know, doing these events and I was looking for a place to donate more raffles that I do every year that I would do in New York City, that when I moved from New York to Tampa, I started to actually, you know, miss giving those out to people. And it's to help them, you know, with their image consulting and their lifestyle needs and coaching and stuff like that. So when I did that, I would go to his events and, you know, donate event, uh, donate the raffles to him. And I got to meet him and his wife, Katie, and they're just such a, an amazing couple because they're both powerhouses. They both have their own businesses. But what I love is that, you know, they can work together and they can work separately. And, and they're not like in competition with each other. And it's pretty amazing because, you know, a husband and wife team, it can get pretty, pretty crazy sometimes. They have two lovely kids. And he moved on from the Tampa Bay Business Owners Association and into podcasting. And he had started like this meetup group, which is now the Florida Podcasting Association. And I remember going to one of the meetings back in like, I don't know, 2014, I really wanted to start podcasting because I had been listening to some over the years and I really felt like it would be a great place for me to to spread my message. And I feel like the easiest way that you can spread your message is through podcasting. And it's such a growing industry right now. And I'm so excited to have Chris here with us tonight so that you can learn some more about it. So without further ado, Let's get him on the line. Hey, Chris, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me, Don. I'm excited to be part of this. I can't believe you have so much going on that I don't know how you do it. Do you have like 10 assistants and 10 housekeepers? Like, how are you doing it all? You know, I used to have a full-time admin and then I saw Elon Musk didn't have one. So I figured, hey, let me just set up a calendar. <laughs> And do it myself. So I'm driving myself nuts, but I'm enjoying being busy and just getting everything scheduled. I have a team, but no one handling my calendar anymore, which is new yeah, for me. That's year. amazing. We have so much to cover today. And I, I don't even know where to begin. You started 
in real estate, right? And then you moved into the networking industry. And you, you're a New Yorker. Woohoo, New York is in the house. But um, how was it when you came into the Tampa area and started doing a business networking adventure there? So when I moved from Long Island, New York to Tampa, I realized that I didn't know anybody, so I would go to meetings. And then I realized, you know, there's no real meeting for business owners, but like where you had to be a business owner to join for um, a certain subset, let's say a million dollars or under in revenue. So small business owners, there wasn't really anything. So we started this group uh, known as the Tampa Bay Business Owners. It was amazing. We had 300 active members. And we created really great education. We brought everybody together. I would say we did at least 1,800 events over nine years. Wow. So it was a lot of fun. In the meantime, I incubated this event called PodFest. And PodFest grew and it kept doubling in size. Now we're seven years in. And then from PodFest, that, that's an event for pod, people that are podcasters or want to learn more about that industry. VidFest was born for video people like YouTube and stuff. So we created this amazing ecosystem of creatives and it's been a wild ride ever since. I think I went to like one of the first meetings when you had the, uh, the meetup groups that you were doing for the podcasting. And I remember meeting the, the what were they called him? The, Pod the pod, yes, yes. He was just our speaker literally today. I just got yeah. off of that. Wow. Six years later, we're still doing our monthly meeting. So the, one of the, my secrets to success is consistency and I love what I do. So people always ask me, like, how do you do all these events? It's like, I actually love it. So for me, it's not like work, even though it's a lot of work. I just consider it a passion and I'm able to serve all these amazing people. And I'm not going to lie to you. There's times it gets overwhelming and I can't keep up with my emails. And uh, last year I did hire a virtual assistant. But what happened was she just couldn't keep up either. So I figured, hey, I might as well just do it myself and keep up (laughs) because there's so many weird requests that I, I get from being a community leader, like people ask me for recommendation letters because of the relationship we've built through the different communities. But let me ask you this, because you went from the business owners, which was a little bit more buttoned up, to a really creative field. Did you find that there was like a major transition going from one to the other? Small business owners tend to be creatives. So a lot of them are musicians. Like I noticed, uh, that was an interesting thing. We did once... Tampa Bay business owners has talent and the talent that our members had was, it was really eye opening. So um, there's a high creative niche uh, attached to entrepreneurism. Um, And it's a more like I'm going to do my own thing kind of thing, which also lends well to creative, creative people. So remember I wasn't dealing with what I would call business builders, people that are in charge of divisions. They grew up the the rat race became leaders. Small business owners are usually people that opt out and like, I'm going to do my own thing and figure out how to take care of myself. And I'll do this thing while I do my gigging on the side. You know, we had uh, a lot of them were involved in bands. I was actually pleasantly surprised uh, how the creative thread actually cuts through. And I myself before um, Tampa Bay business owners used to do two live TV shows. So I have a TV background. I've always liked media. We used to use stream when Ustream was one of the only streaming technologies oh, yes. back then. We used to Ustream. So I've been using this stuff for years. It just was, what happened was, and this will answer your question, um, Anthony, my main man who would help me film everything, we, we would always say, like, we love this business community, but once we find something really creative that we enjoy, we're jumping back into media. So yes. my background, my love really is, I love bringing people together and programming really great content for creatives, podcasters, YouTubers. So for me, it's a lot of fun. But you also, when you're dealing with creatives, they're also, they're personally attached. So the feedback you get sometimes is brutal. Like they don't have a, they don't realize like how to they filter. They don't talk like, they don't, they're very passionate. So they might say things and not realize that they're not delivering it in the right way. Whereas a business person, yeah, has a better like, you know, they'll give you a compliment before they throw you a dig. <laughs> a creative might not have that filter, you know. Okay. I've, I've gone to a lot of conferences in my time. And coming from New York City, I mean, it's just, it's funny because we were both in real estate and it's just, I also did a lot of special event planning and things like that. And I know that doing conferences is definitely one of the toughest things. I mean, because you have all of these different personality types and having to get the right speakers in front of the the group and all that. Now, the one I went to, I was blown away. I think the first one I went to was in 2015, down in West Shore there. And 
I had just came back from social media week in New York City, right into the pod fest. And I was blown away. It was like night and day. Now here was this massive social media week conference in New York City, right? But it was so cold and it was just, it was so sterile. It was just really, it made me feel uncomfortable being there. Like I wanted to fly out of there and come back home. And then I came into PodFest and like within seconds, the first room I was in, I felt like everybody's, you know, open arms, welcome me in. And I hadn't launched the podcast yet. And I have to say, it really inspired me so much to get my podcast started so that by the next year I was up and running and Dave Jackson, people like, you know, massive people that were there, everyone was so pleasant. And it really, it was the first conference that I ever went to that I can say really made me feel like I was visiting a family. It was so much fun. And I love that you can do that with your events because it's really a a difficult thing to do. It's not as easy as people think that might be it's really tough especially when you have all the different types of personalities and I don't know how you do it Chris I mean it's just I have to give you so many kudos because it's just amazing what you've built well so so you you mentioned a couple things so we realize that we're not putting on a conference necessarily we're putting on a community event for our family so we approach it that way and the one year Dawn I, I hired like a very professional like event planner and she was great but she was sterile because she was just doing her job. So we made the distinction. We don't want someone in the planning that is not invested in the community. So I know that sounds like a small distinction, but that's a big deal. No, that's huge. So even though the event planner, she was actually phenomenal. Like I have no complaints. She was amazing. But we want people, if they're going to be part of our team, to be part of the community. Now it's harder to manage, but for long term, it's a cultural match. So we, we love our community. And we literally, when we're working with our schedules and how we're going to do everything, we envision what is Dawn's experience going to be like? How can we make them feel welcome? And remember, we, we deal with people from all walks of life. We'll have people that are visually impaired, uh, people that have scooters or they can't walk. So we have to figure out like, what are their needs? So we do our best to make sure, Dawn, I don't know if you saw this, but this was one thing that got me choked up. Maxwell Ivy, he's known as the blind blogger. He lost his sight in his 20s. So unlike some people that have lost their sight earlier, some people are just easier, but he has, it's not as intuitive for him to get around because he was an adult uh, until he lost his vision. So he has some trouble getting around without a guide. He would need someone. So we also have treasure maps and that, that is literally a physical map that you take booth to booth and they have to sign off and you get, you could win a prize and all that. Maxwell Ivy entered the exhibit hall because he knows we got his back as a community and a culture. And he said, I don't know how I'm going to get this treasure map filled, but people are going to help me. And each exhibitor would say, Max, do you need help getting to the next booth? He said, yep. And each vendor took him hand by hand to the next vendor. And his map was filled out by the end because all the vendors helped him travel the exhibit floor. And he was able to enter the um, treasure map. Now, unfortunately, we threw out those maps. I wish I had that because I I want to frame it. That but he, I have the story uh, and we filmed it. But isn't that an amazing story of, so of the amazing. community, of you know, the exhibitors felt ownership. And that's when, you know, you got something that your attendees, your exhibitors, your speakers, everybody's lined as well as the crew and the volunteers together. I was so upset that uh, I wasn't able to get out there this year because, I mean, with this coronavirus, it literally your your event was like, what, like <laughs> days when it was like kicking in. And, and I know I had some health challenges, so I knew I couldn't attend. And I was so bummed out. But thanks for the recordings because that really saved the yeah, day. I've never had more pressure. Now I could tell you, like, if you were like, what's the most pressure-filled event you've ever done? Promoting against a virus that none of us know what the heck's going to happen. I'm worried about everybody's health. We have, you know, uh, Lee Silverstein, who's undergoing chemo, and everybody's got different health things. And you got to think about your audience. I've never had that much pressure where you're worried about everybody's well-being. Like, that, that, that's when I'll be talking about when I'm old and gray and people are like, when was that time? I'm like, well, let me tell you, there was a year where all of us didn't know what was going to happen. and everything I, stopped. I was blown away that you still had it for starters, that it didn't get shut down. And, you know, all the precautions that you took was amazing. And I was online with the app. And so I was talking with people and everything. They're like, Oh, we just did this. So everyone was having an amazing time. And it's like, nobody was worried about it. 
it was the last thing on their mind. They knew they were in good hands. They knew that you had the leadership to have it under control and they would be okay. And that to me right there was like, this is magical. This is really magical. I am. Um, I bought these, uh, these, <laughs> these big wipes. I bought like, uh, I bought like, I don't know, like 40 of these, like a lot of them. Wow. And we barely used any. At the end of the conference, we had like 18 or 20 left. And Jeannie's like, you want to return them? I'm like, no, I'm taking them home. She's thing. like, I'm going to need them. I'm like, because I had done my research. Mm. I mean, I just wanted everything to be wiped down, the hand sanitizing, stations to be everywhere, people to have Purell. And then, you know, good luck trying to get all this stuff oh. at the same time. I did it. it was something like you said, we'll all remember. And um, I'm down to my last two or three canisters of, <laughs> of hand wipes. <laughs> See, they, they came in handy. I know. They're like a commodity. Now. It's like it was the hardest thing to find. Yeah, I got gold. Like, if I only knew, you know, I would have been like buying stock of this stuff. So tell me, if someone is interested in becoming a podcaster, what would you suggest for them? Well, there's two things I would ask them. One is, why do you want to be a podcaster and what's the objective? So you have people that want to um, do it as a hobby. And I want to be very clear. I do it as a hobby. I'm very supportive of that group of people. But then you have people that want to do it as a business. And I'm very supportive of that as well. And I think it's okay to make a profit or have an objective that you want to make money from your art. So the, the only thing I would say is have realistic expectations. And, you know, you have to build an audience. And if you're putting something out there and you want to make something, you have to build trust with your audience. And when you do that, then you could find things that maybe you could put in front of them or you could market your own products and services in front of that audience. Monetization and audience building are the two top things people ask. How do I build an audience and how do I monetize? And for some people, it happens sooner than later. For other people, it takes a little bit longer. But with podcasting, there are ways to monetize. There's plenty of people monetizing, but they're actively asking themselves, how can I create value for my audience, for my listeners? So that's kind of what I would say. And then the other thing is look for keywords. So go on iTunes and search the words that you're trying to name your podcast and see if they're taken or if they're available and then do what's called a related search. When you go to iTunes and you find something that looks like, oh, I kind of like this show. It's similar to what I want to do iTunes has a button called related um, shows or, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. You click related shows and it shows you wh what the audience listens to. And that's that'll great. help you kind of do your initial research of what to do. That's great advice. Thank you for sharing that because um, when I was trying to think of a show for myself, it was like, what do I want to do? What do I want to talk about? And, you know, I wanted to make sure that you give the value, that you give something of them that they can, you know, have something needed to chew on. And, um, one of the things that I realized, like, you know, I had this image consulting business and the lifestyle coaching, but I felt like I want to do that. But I also knew that as a drummer, I wanted to keep my musicianship alive and working in the music industry for many years. And I just felt like that's a part of me that I didn't really want to give up. So I just decided, well, I'll make two shows. But little did I know, like, how much work that entails. <laughs> yeah, you, you got it. You, right. That's the other thing is know how much time yeah. and energy you want to put into it. And it's okay if you're... You could like, here's some formats. Some people do a podcast weekly. Some people do it daily, which is a lot of work. Some people do it once a month. Some people do it seasonally where you drop like a Netflix series, 10 shows for the season. Whatever fits your schedule, you can do it. Don't guilt yourself. Have fun with it. And then you mentioned like the drumming. So I have a young lady in DC area and she came to me and she goes, I want to do a real estate podcast. And I said, is that what you, you want to do that? She goes, yeah, but she wasn't like a hundred percent. I go, what do you do for a living? She goes, I'm an AML compliance officer. And I pretend like I knew what that was. You know, <laughs> she's like, yeah, oh yeah, that's great. Right, right. So then I said, do you like what you do? She goes, yeah. I go, what the hell is an AML compliance? You know, what is it? She was anti-money laundering. I work for the banks. Oh, wow. And she lit up, right? And I said, you really like that, don't you? She goes, yeah. I go, well, why don't you do a podcast about that? She goes, people would listen to that. I go, I'm assuming there's some interesting stories about drug dealers and people screwing over the banks. She goes, she goes, I could talk about them forever. I go, people would love those stories. Those are very interesting stories. She goes, well, why would I do that? I go, do you want to uh, grow your footprint in that industry as a thought leader and move up in the mm -hmm. ecosystem? She goes, yeah, that would be a dream come true. I go, start a podcast and you'll elevate yourself across your, because she goes to a lot of those conferences for the AML compliance office. And she did one about the Panama Papers. That was the breach out of Panama where all these people uh -huh. hiding hundreds of billions of dollars. She had hundreds of downloads because it was an interesting story. Uh -huh. And anti-money laundering is people like listening. It's helped her confidence level, but also now she's a thought leader within her place. So it does have a monetization, but think about what it did for her career when other people see her like, oh, that's the person that has 
the AML, anti-money laundering, one case at a time we're talking about. So wow. that, that leveraged her in her industry. So it doesn't have to be entrepreneurial. It could be you're an employee and you want to be uh, elevated within your industry. And I noticed more musicians are getting podcasts like Daddy B from Dirty Heads. He started a podcast. And I feel like for those who are producers or songwriters, that it would benefit to really start something. Because right now, there may not be so many live gigs happening out there with everything going on. But they can still, like you say, they can still monetize. And they can still find a way to sell their merchandise and things like that and still stay in in business because we don't know what's coming our way and it is changing so quickly and especially in the music industry it was changing to begin with when everybody was just doing downloads but now you know if you don't have a place to go out and gig and get paid for that gig i find that podcasting may be a great way for them to make a living at least yeah and a lot of musicians are doing those free streams on uh yes. facebook so you could take it, you know this, i'm preaching to a choir but anyone listening you could take that stream so let me let me give a concept that people might not understand. The difference between a stream and a download. I want you to imagine walking through a shopping mall and you have those little kiosks in the middle where the people are trying to spray you with uh, lotions or they give you samples. I remember once I was with my nephews and I wasn't paying attention. Someone gave me a sample and I went to eat it. It was so, <laughs> I didn't realize it was chocolate. I thought it was so, chocolate. And then the lady's running after me. No, 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 no. And then my nephews were laughing their butts off. So those people are trying to get your attention because I'm walking through the mall and they happen to be in the way of traffic. That's what a stream is. When you're streaming on Facebook, I'm scrolling through my feed. Maybe I'll stop and see what you're doing. But when you walk into, let's say, a specific store, when I walk through that area and I go to, let's say, Best Buy or Dick's Sporting Goods, I'm going in for that specific thing to that specific counter. That's what a download is. A download is a much more qualified listener. And what a lot of people don't realize, like, oh, I have a podcast. I put the stream out every week on Facebook. The problem is we can't find it once you put it out there. We could find it in real time. But if you took that stream and you put it into the podcast store, iTunes, for instance, now I have a, uh, think of it as a library of record for all your different uh, musical endeavors for me to ingest at my leisure. And now you could build a fan base over time. So that's what a lot of people don't realize. They think, oh, I'm streaming. It's the same thing. It's not the same thing. So you need to have a home for your stuff. And that's what a YouTube channel would be like or a, a podcast. I know. love that. And and it's true because I, there are some podcasts that I found, but it was just like, oh, and I would just binge, you know, and just go through everything that they had there because it was so helpful and I was getting so much um, value out of their content. And I really want to reiterate that when somebody does a show to try to really give them something of value because, you know, it's all about serving and, that's why I love you guys so much because you and Katie, you guys rock. And he's got like the greatest wife. It's, they're, they're an amazing couple. And the thing is, is that, you know, when you guys are so busy, you could do 50 things at the same time and then you're still working together and you still have your family time. I mean, to me, it's like how you do any of that balancing is really beyond. <laughs> so it's only 24 I, hours, but how do you do it? it just but I grew up in a big fat Greek family. So family always came first. So even though I'm passionate about working, and today is the one day of the month where I'm going to be working late. But I do bath time with the girls every day. Um, and that's like my, like, I, I yell at my wife when she puts them in. Let's say I'm late. And she's mm. like, oh, I thought I was helping. I go, no, no, you're, you're robbing me of my, like, that's my highlight of the day. In right. the bathtub, hanging out with the girls and playing, you know, bubbles and soap and little <laughs> things. So, um, so it's just, it's family first. Uh, luckily, I had a lot of great mentors. My neighbor was a New York City firefighter. He'd always take us out on 7-Eleven Slurpee runs as kids, and we all played out in the neighborhood. So it was impressed upon me, uh, luckily for me. So there, it's a hardwire thing. It's not even a balance. Like, you have to do that. Now, I will tell you, there's times I get distracted by my phone, and I do have to turn it off because I do love what I do. So that's, that's the other thing is just knowing where to create those boundaries. And, you know, the fact that you said you could be here with us today really was like, oh, wow, you can. Because I thought for sure, you know, I'm going to ask him and he's going to have too many things going on and he won't be able to do it. So I was really excited to have you. So really, well, it worked yeah. out. We had the meeting, the Florida podcast meeting. So I'm late in the office. So it was like perfect timing. <laughs> that's awesome. And so... Do you see podcasting as like it's a trend and it's going to disappear in a few years or is this just going to grow even more exponentially? Don, you, you, because you came to PodFest in 2015 when we first started, um, before that we had like two workshops a year prior, but you were at the very first one. Like you're part of history of like the movement of podcasting literally because 
you know, we were in a little crappy hotel room. We were so excited about the future. Um, for anyone listening to this, we were in Tampa and every hotel is next to some kind of strip club. So when people flew in, they would ask me, why did you put the event next to a strip club? If you live in Tampa, you don't even realize that that's even, everything's next to a strip club as far as we're concerned, depending on whatever. So then, um, you know, each year it doubled in size. So we went from 100 to 181. And then a member of ours, Neil Gilarte, said, Chris, you got to move it to Orlando. This is much bigger than, t- we all love Tampa, like we live here. But he's like, listen, for the travelers and the people coming from all over the world, you got to take it to Orlando. And I said, uh, Neil, I don't have the money to guarantee like my house on the line. Because for anyone that's never done like a convention hotel, it's a lot, a of, lot money. of money. You're guaranteeing six figures many times. He said, listen, my sister runs. She's 20 years service manager of this big resort over there. She said, the sales lady will help you out. Just go over there. I go over there and the sales lady gives me the hotel. We could fit up to like 350 people at the time, uh, 370 or 400. And she said, she gave it to me for three, $3,500 of food and beverage guarantee wow. and like a few room nights. And I was like, confu- I was Dawn, I was confused. I was scratching my head and I'm like, it's the first time I ever felt bad for a hotel negotiations. The lady kept lowering the price while I was thinking like, how is this happening? So I drove That's home amazing. and I said, Neil, I said, Neil, what the heck happened? What did your sister tell that sales lady? Because she was negotiating with herself. I've never seen this before. I signed, <laughs> I, I, I signed the contract. I mean, I was, I was like, every time I shut up, she kept lowering the price. He said, <laughs> Neil goes, when I moved to Tampa, because Neil lived in Orlando, you helped me and my family start my video business. Because uh, I had that local community, Tampa Bay Business Owners. He goes, and he's from a very proud and la- large Venezuelan family. He goes, my sister who's the service met, like she services all events in there. She told that sales lady, if you don't give them a deal that is so good, I will not service any of your events this year. Wow. So the sales lady was afraid to not upset the service okay. manager. I said, why would your sister do that? He said, well, my sister said, you help me start my business. Our family owes you one and this is us paying you back. Oh, how great is that? Oh my gosh. And th- so I, I mean, you want to talk about... <laughs> I want to talk about people helping. Like, I didn't know that that would happen like that. And that gave me a new life and a new, it helped us as a community grow. I could never afford that at the time. Like I wasn't going to, young family, I'm not going to risk that. And that helped us grow double. And now this past year, we had 2,000 attendees. 2,000? Wow. We didn't have 2,000 show. I want to be clear because of coronavirus. Because of corona. Somewhere around 1,500 show, which I was. Wow. Wow. Very happy because, as you know, it was getting really intense there that last week. Um, so it's a miracle. And next year we'll probably have, you know, I'm assuming somewhere yes. around 3,000 Yes, and I brought attendees. my ticket for next year, so I'm yeah. ready to go. it's going to be great. <laughs> I can't wait. I know we have very little time left, and I just – where can people learn more about the um, the expo? Yeah, the conference, you can go to podfestexpo.com or if you're into YouTube, vidfestexpo.com. Both of them kind of happen at the same place, but depending on what you're into. And then for me, Um I, I would just tell people, if you're looking to get started and you're stuck, I wrote a book called Start Ugly and it's up on Amazon. Buy the physical book if you can because it, it's it's written like a post-it note. The cover's like a post-it note and it's a really good reminder to kind of get out of your own way and start ugly and get things going. Um, book, we will be doing way. a virtual event um, this summertime. So we're excited. We're still, listen, we're, we're rocking and rolling. Our community, Don, you know this better than anyone. Our people, I call them ride or die. They're ride or die. We're all in together and we're going to help each other. Um, and we did a little test for a virtual event. I had a guy from uh, a Japanese guy who's living in India. And I go, how did you find out about it? So he goes, someone in your community sent me the link. And I was like, wow, wow. our community has now gone around the world and back. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the documentary you did? Because you're also producing and doing filmmaking now as well. Yeah. So that year, that you, the first year you came, the second year when we were putting it on, we had all these amazing characters like Glenn the Geek, a guy that talks about horses with the Horse Radio Network. Danny Pena, this young you know kid from Manhattan who's doing... He's talking about gaming, but through an audio podcast and, you know, my wife, Katie, and all these amazing people. So we commissioned a crowdfunding campaign. And what I did was the small profits I got from year two of PodFest, I was like, I'm going to put into this movie. And the reason why we created documentaries, we got tired of people asking us like, what is podcasting? I don't see what it is Mm. because it's audio. There was no visual representation showing them these people helping other people through uh, podcasting. So it kind of took off and it, we got distribution out of LA 
thousands of people watched it on Amazon Prime. I then took it off Amazon Prime and put it on YouTube free of charge. Just go to The Messengers of Podcast Documentary. It's a 59-minute total documentary about the world of podcasting and why these people do what they do and how they relate to their audience and how their audience relates to them. I love that. Thank you. Um, Because it was just... I said, you know, he's the jack of all trades, master of all, <laughs> because it's like whatever you decide to work on, you just have this like magic wand that you can wave and it always seems to just come out like magical is the only way I could explain it. Well, and- Katie, asked, Katie asked me once, like I have the book Start Ugly and we do the events. If you really look underneath all of it, it's um, my mission is to give people the belief that they could do whatever it is that they want to do so they could live a life with no regrets. So every project that I do, it's like a common thread in all of it. And that's what drives me. So I just look at it like, okay, if I, if I need to reach them through a documentary and that's what I, I got to do, I'll do that. If I need to reach them with the book and they're reading, I'm going to do that. If they want to come. So I'm covering my bases of how can I use the energy I have on this earth to fulfill that mission. That's the common thread. Someone asked me once, and I, and I, I didn't know. I had to think about it. I was like, oh, well, my, Katie was the one like, oh, it's mm-hmm. simple. She goes, that's the thread you do with everything. Otherwise, you're not inspired to do it. You always come from love. And I, I mean, that's one thing that, you know, with you and your family, every time I'm around you guys, I always feel uplifted. And I, I never feel any bad vibes. You know, it's not like, oh, I'm too busy. I'm stressed and I can't be bothered. You always take the time, no matter what's going on around you, to really stop and listen to that person who's speaking with you. And so I really thank you for doing all that you do for the community because you rock. And, you know, I don't know where I'd be without you. So thank you. Well, thank you for being part of the community, Dawn, and doing so many great things out there. Thank you for teaching people Zoom. (laughs) We we went from 10 million users of Zoom to 200 million. If you ask, I'm sure if you and I had a conversation, we'd be like, everybody knows how to use Zoom. Up until the pandemic, we assumed like people knew how to use it. And then you realize like your relatives don't know how to use it. People in corporate America, most of them didn't know it existed. And let alone trying to work at home with a home environment. And I know like I've been working, you know, as my side hustle from home forever. And so it's like my family can never understand that they they think, you know, if you're working from home, you're not working. Right. (laughs) So like, uh, no, I'm working. (laughs) It's like I'm actually getting work done. But they don't know what that is. And it's and I think a lot of people right now, they were saying, oh, yeah, working from home. And then they're really not getting productive because <laughs> they start doing this and start doing that. And if you have kids, I don't even know how they're doing it at all. It's tough. It's tough. Oh my gosh. Because you guys, you were quarantined for, for quite a bit there. And the first, I'm not going to lie to you, the first couple of months, because we're both entrepreneurs and Katie has her shows and I'm trying to do my stuff. It was tough because we had to, now the everything's, there's some normalcy, but in the beginning it was, people that were homeschooled, they were, my friends were like, we didn't have to adjust. We were already dealing with but if you had to go from, you know, your schedule, it is what it is. You know, listen, could be worse things. Luckily, we're all okay. Uh, for the most part, there's some people that we lost. But, and, and you know, my heart goes out to those families. But um, it, luckily, it could have been a lot worse. Oh, I know. All I could say is we did the best we knew how with the information we had. Now we're coming out of the fog and we're figuring out, um, you know, if you have someone that has an autoimmune disease, you're right. It, we did high, It did get people... It was the news 24 seven. And if yeah. you, it made people sick, it made me sick, literally, because yeah. I was watching it and I was getting sick to my stomach before. See, my I couldn't ventilator. watch. I just, I had to be, you know, I stopped watching the news probably about 30 years ago. Uh, only because it was just, everything Smart. was bad. It was bad, 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 bad. And I thought, you know what? I, I had, you know, had been hit by the drunk driver and had a couple other accidents. And so I felt like that negativity, like I only wanted to have positive things in my life. So I just stopped watching the news. I try to stay on top of like current events and see what's going on because I don't want to be ignorant, obviously. But I felt like I kept telling people, stop watching every day. You know, like you want to check in to see what's going on, but then just jump off and, you know, go back to Unfortunately, Don, I, I got sucked in because I was watching it for updates for PodFest. I don't watch um, it either. And I was getting sucked in, and you know how it is. Once they yeah, get once. you get in, it's it gets in. You, so luckily, I was able to wean myself off probably like a month after Podfest. But then uh, going on walks and figuring things out. But it's That's not tough. it's not good. It's built to get reactions out of everybody. Yeah. So you know, I I don't want to hold you up here because I know that you guys want to spend some time with your family. So I just want to again thank you for being here and thank you for all that you do. I really appreciate you, and I hope to see you at your next event and if you need anything from me please you know feel free to reach out and let me know you know 
Yeah, just be who you are and be the, like I always tell people, you know, you have a good culture when the Don Marie's of the world, when I'm not around, if someone's not acting right, you'll be very nice and say, hey, if you're in PodFest, here's how we act. Here's what I would recommend you do. I'll help you connect, but do yourself a favor. I always tell people, we always look out for the crumb snatchers. They come in the room and they're snatching crumbs and they're running out. And the, my favorite thing is when someone like yourself, Don Marie, says, hey, let me show you how this community works. We help each other. We communicate with each other. And you kind of re-educate the person. And then either one or two things happen. Either like, oh, okay, great. You know, they really care about me. Let me act like this is a group of people that actually know who I am. Or, uh, which I'm okay with, hey, this is not for me. I just came to get my crumbs and this is not the place to to snatch my crumbs. So let me go to the next place. And when that happens, and that did happen this past year, Don, we, um, Oh yeah. Yeah. What I mean is the culture was so strong. It's growing. And oh, people absolutely. always ask me how they, they go, how does your community and culture keep getting stronger? It's because we have people like yourself that support us in the hallways that are watching out for the community, not just me. We're all in it together. And that really creates um, a great environment. Yeah. We only had one person that they're like, oh, no one would buy my stuff. It's like, yeah, well, you're in the wrong place. You're here to build and receive and, and give back. Uh, but out of 1,500 people, I'll take that all day long. They, they just The crumb snatchers don't come back. So we're, we're doing well. I'm so excited, and I really can't wait for the next one. And you guys out there, if you're interested in podcasting at all, you definitely want to get it signed up and join us next year because you're going to be floored at what you're going to learn. And you, you get so much in a condensed amount of time. I mean. It's amazing. And it's not like you can't digest it either because everything is done. Like they give you all of the condensed version. It's like getting the, uh, you know, the, the cheat notes there because it's like you got the best of the best coming in to tell you how they did it. And as quickly as, you know, not necessarily as quickly as they do, but they tell you so that you can get started quickly and you could just, you know, jump off that springboard and, and catapult into who knows what. So I find that, you know, if you really are interested in podcasting, you have to be there because I wouldn't keep saying it if I didn't mean it. And it's really a spectacular show. So I hope you get out there and I hope you start podcasting, guys, because it's a lot of fun. Although if you're smart and you have the budget, send out your editing to someone else. Yes. It's, it's a I lot of work. <laughs> I still do all my own stuff and I can't wait to give it to somebody else one day. <laughs> but thank you, Chris. I really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Don Marie. I appreciate you. it. Thanks for being at the first ever pod fest it's not a lot of people could say they, they did that thank you don marie <laughs> have a good night okay thank you you too all right Hud. thank you again be good bye and thank you for being with us today i really appreciate it and remember it's never too late to leave a trailblazing behind you so rock on and mock out and i'll catch you on the flip side 